Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. It's The In Show, Australia's only show dedicated to innovation from Adelaide, Australia and across the globe. Hi, this is David Grice and Troy Simcock and we are talking about innovations, entrepreneurs, startups, people with great ideas. You know, everyone that we've spoken to has been an inspiration on The In Show thus far, David. They certainly have. And uh, Troy, how's your week? Week's been good. Went to Sydney for 15 hours. 15 hours. What a great investment that was. (laughs) Did you drive? 16 hour drive? No. Or 15 hour trip? No, nothing like that. Got on a plane and uh, went to the opening night of Sydney Festival. Went to a performance called Tree of Codes. It's a dance performance. The music was done by Jamie XX, who's uh, an artist that I really love, but it was incredibly innovative. The way they use sets and the music. It was almost like uh, um, the reviews of it was that people were going to see a dance performance like they were going to see a gig. And, you know, you begin to see that as an innovation, you know, for some of these um, cultural enterprises that feel like they're sort of they're very niche, the ability to be able to open up the door in a different way and have people access, you know, what you've been creating. Uh, you know, I think of traditional things like classical music and, and stuff like that. There will be some people that just don't ever go and see classical music. How do you get them through the door? Mm, that's really exciting, actually, just to, just to think that, you know, that kind of performance, they're, they're just thinking completely differently about it. Yeah, like going to see a concert but with dancing. Unbelievable. On the show today, we spent some time with a woman who's been described as an inspiration by her colleagues. Wendy Perry is the Managing Director of Workforce Blueprint, working across education and training. Wendy has developed, designed and implemented systems for workforce planning and development, entrepreneurship and education throughout her career. Yeah, she's an incredibly impressive lady. But now here's Claire, another impressive woman, with more in news, including a story about black holes and a process, you're going to love this, David, you've probably never heard about. It's called quenching. What else have you got for us, Claire? Cheers, guys. This week I'll be talking about life-sucking black holes and what's in store for augmented reality in 2018. But first, researchers from the University of Michigan have developed a non-invasive treatment for tinnitus. Millions of people around the world who live with the incurable disorder hear phantom sounds like buzzing and ringing. Sufferers can either see a cognitive behavioural specialist to help them deal with the distress, use sound to drown it out, or get brain surgery, which isn't guaranteed guaranteed to work. The disorder is caused by neurons which are misfired in part of the brainstem called the dorsal cochlear nucleus, which is responsible for processing oral information. The misfired neurons are meant to be activated when sound is interpreted by the brain. People with tinnitus have these neurons firing all the time whether there's sound or not. So researchers in Michigan have developed a small box-like device that can help. It can retrain the brain by using combinations of pulses and sounds that decrease the amount of neurons. All users have to do is wear headphones and a set of electrodes on the head and neck for 30 minutes a day. Most of the volunteers who've tested the device say their tinnitus went away after using it for a few weeks, but that it came back after one week without it. More testing will be conducted on people with different types of tinnitus in April. Augmented reality is set to become mainstream this year. That means you can expect a whole lot more functionality. At the moment, most smartphones are primed to support AR, but we're just waiting for the interesting and super handy apps. There are apps available already, like one that helps you learn how to use a coffee machine. All you have to do is point your phone's camera at the machine and your screen will tell you what the different knobs do. It's a live walkthrough, not a tutorial. The app can even tell you if the water needs refilling or if the coffee capsule hasn't been inserted properly. But this is just the beginning. This year, live AR apps will instruct you on how to put together furniture, fun live games will put zombies in your bedroom, you'll be able to virtually try on shoes to see if they fit, or even use the technology to see what restaurants offer the best deals on the street you're walking on. Tech companies including Facebook, Apple and Google are all investing millions of dollars into the technology, so expect life to get a whole lot more interesting. In the middle of every galaxy lies a huge black hole, but they don't just consume objects that pass near it. This new breakthrough proves that a black hole can eventually become so large that it stops galaxies from producing new stars in a process called quenching. Stars are created from cold gas, but when black holes become large enough, this gas is sucked into the void, causing bursts of high energy. This energy forces the cold gas out of the galaxy, making it impossible for new stars to form. The researchers analysed information 
information about light from the Hobby Eberly Telescope Massive Galaxy Survey to develop historical snapshots of the formation of stars in galaxies. They then compared the histories of multiple black holes and discovered that quenching begins earlier and faster in galaxies that have bigger black holes. In a couple of billion years, this will be the inevitable fate of our own Milky Way galaxy. All of the stars will be quenched and the black hole will dissipate. And that's what's in news this week. Thanks, Claire. Well, David, they're about to turn the lights out on us. Oh, my goodness. What, what are we going to do when you want to, you know, have a romantic evening with your, your partner? You, you're sort of sitting by the beach, you're looking into the sky, <laughs> you see that myriad of beautiful stars and they're all gone. You know, I know we're not going to be here to experience it. It's going to be billions of years away, but part of me wants to stick around to see what this is like because does that mean that, you know, the sun is a star? Does that mean that one day there's literally the lights are going to be turned out on us? Well, sun- Imagine that, you're sunbathing on the beach and gone. Gone. No sunsets. I mean, Syria, I mean, the implications of that. It, it really is kind of mind-boggling, isn't it? Well, because humans need sunlight. I mean, we need vitamin D. Is that, does that mean the end of the human race? Is this going to be the thing that wipes us out? I thought it was going to be, you know, Donald Trump dropping a nuclear bomb. <laughs> and here it is, a black hole is going to just take away everything we've known and loved. Where's Sheldon Cooper when you need him? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> David Grice and Troy Sincock, we're talking innovation on The In Show. You can check us out at the inshow.online Facebook and follow The In Show on Twitter. Now, coming up, we speak to Workforce Blueprint Managing Director Wendy Perry, an incredible woman who's built a reputation as a leading authority on workforce planning and development and vocational education and training. The In Show, what's in? Well, Scott Bucock, he's the CEO of Hegs Australia, is going to share with us his winning innovation cycle. Yes, I call it the winning cycle, and the W is why, the I is idea, the N for network, N for no man's land, I for innovate, N for now the how, and G for go for it. Now the how's at the end there simply because the how's the easy part. There's Google, there's friends, there's network, but it's all about why you actually had the idea in the first place. The I is quite interesting. I um, I like to talk about the I a lot because uh, there's adults versus kids on this one. Adults have a real problem. They come up with an idea and then they really go, oh, you know, no one's going to buy it. No one's going to, you know, what's going to look like? I've got to make it the best. Whereas kids go, they come up with an idea and they just go for it. They just go, it's going to look like this, it's going to feel like this. And to give you an example of that is my kids, eight and ten, uh, took my phone away one day and uh, for about 10 minutes and came back and said, here, Dad, here's an idea. And what they'd done was put a broom and a mop together, taped it together and said, there you go, you can broom and mop at the same time. I went, that's pretty cool. I said, but how are we going to sell it? He said, so we sat down and we came up with some marketing ideas and we said, why don't we call it the bop? And so it was all about the sell and we said, it's great to have the idea, but how are we, gonna, how are we really going to make it an item, give it some uh, personality, I guess. Uh, anyway, that bop now has a coffee machine in the middle of it, just in case you want one halfway around the, <laughs> around the house. But uh, <laughs> the story the, the story is the idea with kids. They love coming up with ideas. So we should enhance and embrace and actually educate them on how to take those to market. It's David Grice and Troy Sincock. And if you've missed an episode, make sure you subscribe to the In Show podcast on iTunes. The In Show. Now, Wendy Perry is an inspiration. She's the Managing Director of Workforce Blueprint, working across education and training. Wendy's developed, designed and implemented systems for workforce planning and development, entrepreneurship and education throughout her career, and has taken her to all corners of the globe. So, Wendy, where did you develop your passion for this work? I guess it really came in my early days when um, I was a trainee myself when I started my career, Mm. and I saw... Um, the importance of adult learning and education and at the age of 21 I started teaching adults myself and saw people kind of transform their lives, you know, getting back into the workforce or women who perhaps weren't participating or new migrants, young people, just so many different examples of people, you know, changing their aspiration, their goals, um, what they thought that they could actually do. Mm -hmm. So really it's never too late. No, it's never too late. It's never too early either. <laughs> so when you tell us what happened, like you, you left school and how, how did your career begin and, and where did you start? So uh, when I was 19, I started working for the Department of Transport. So I left school and I took a year off. I actually had a um, young daughter at the time as well. And I thought that maybe I wanted to do university. I did a year or two of that and I didn't enjoy what I was studying. So what I were you studying? Economics. Uh, yeah. No so. wonder you didn't enjoy it. <laughs> it's true. It's true. But I loved the um, the uh, sociology and the politics side of it. But at the time I thought, you know, I really need to get into the workforce and uh, state government were advertising these traineeships. So I thought I'd have a go, got that role, Department of Transport, and um, then from there went on to work at 
Telstra too, and then started that sort of teaching with uh, training organisations, you know, in my early 20s. So what um, what led you then, then into specifically looking at, you know, uh, careers and, and how they develop and, and what's required as far as skills are concerned? Was there, was there a journey in that, just getting you along that path, or was that just something that sort of evolved as you, you went through your, your career? Yeah, I remember my dad saying to me that I used to collect jobs. I used to always look at what jobs were available and be keen on, you know, what sort of things were um, were out there. But uh, from that sort of early days with teaching, uh, I did that for a couple of years and I worked in different industry organisations and on various sort of projects, workforce-related projects. And when I was 25, I became an educational manager, which is most people were like 20 years older than me in that same job role. And I had a lot of independence and freedom. I could pretty much do whatever I wanted to. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that covered a lot of the business, you know, kind of areas, management and contact centres at the time. And uh, I then had a role where I was a senior policy advisor and that was working with schools um, within the department and that was really looking at careers and industry opportunities and how to collaborate with employers and industry. Mm -hmm. Um, So by that time I was about 28 Uh, I did that for a little bit of time, but I found that a little bit uh, bureaucratic. I didn't have the independence that I had in the previous job roles. So 28 is when I started my company 15 years ago. That's extraordinary. It's an early start. You obviously, you know, just found your your lane and uh, and, and discovered that really early. It's wonderful to hear uh, about, you know, the impact that you feel um, that you can have on people's lives um, through your work. Mm -hmm. I know that, um, you know, having worked in radio for most of my life, there was, you know, it happens many times where, you know, there'll be an entire turnover of staff or they'll completely change direction. I'll never forget being a young person and having all these people that I grew up listening to on the radio and held in really high regard um, and then saw them all got you know, lose their jobs one after the other on the same day Mm -hmm. and then realise that those guys, you know, really thought that they were going to be doing the same thing all of their lives and that they were put into this moment not by their choosing where they all of a sudden Mm -hmm. had to think, you know, what can I do now? Yeah. Yeah, it it really does. And they ended up doing all sorts of different things, you know, uh, in sales jobs and all kinds of stuff. So what's your um, thinking behind keeping training up, particularly given that there are new jobs on the way, there'll be jobs that we don't even know about right now. Like how do people prepare for that kind of thing? I tend to take a pretty pragmatic, practical approach about this. So um, when we're doing workforce planning, we're usually looking out three, five years. It's normally the time frame that companies and employers can sort of manage. Mm. If it's like with a country or a region, we might be looking at 15 or 20 years. But a lot of it comes down to what people can also cope with and manage in terms of that change. Mm. And you've got to sort of have the conversation and try and put people into that three to five year picture, which can be challenging, but there's some different techniques and tools that you can do to do that. And you've got to make the scenario as real as you possibly can to then figure out, okay, well, what would the job roles in fact be? What would you sort of be doing day to day? What kind of technologies might you be using? And what sort of skills would you need? And there is clearly like a set of common 21st century capabilities that if you have those sorts of things, you can pretty much, you know, turn your hand at anything else or pick up other technical skills. So, What are those skills? There's quite a few. There's about nine of them, so I won't remember them all off the top of my head. Communication is key, but it's not basic. It's more about actual influence and persuasion and bringing people along with you and mm-hmm. being able to pitch in conversation and so on. There's things like imagination and intelligence and, you know, there's a lot of discussion about artificial intelligence, technology, robotics impacting on job roles and it's, it's almost like the human aspect of the job role is going to get more human, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. There's science, technology, engineering and mass uh, combined with entrepreneurship but applying that in a particular industry sort of area as well. Um, so, yeah, many things that, um, you know, you need you need to sort of make sure that you're not redundant, basically. Yeah. Mm. And you, you obviously look at a couple of different lenses. So you have a lens where you're looking at from the employer's point of view mm-hmm. and then you're also looking at it from the students or the people that are trying to gain work's point of view. Yep. What are you finding um, through your work with employers particularly that, that, are, that are key points that you're having to help them with in order to get them ready for the future as well? I think, um, well, that point about thinking in that three to five year window when they don't normally do that. Like they're still usually focused on pretty operational type things. They don't always have a strategic view about their workforce. They might about their business, but then when you go, okay, well, what does that mean for your workforce specifically? Some people will put up barriers and just say, well, how can we even know? But it's almost like 
if you don't make, if you can't define that, if you can't have a go at that at least, then whatever happens is going to just roll on and it's totally out of your control. But generally speaking, employers will focus on some of those 21st century capabilities that I mentioned before. Younger people and job seekers think that the technical side of things is more important. So there's usually a mismatch, um, if you like, between what employers and industry are looking for and what you know, younger people or people entering the workforce, whatever cohort they might be, mm -hmm. thinks important. And um, that sort of plays out in all sorts of different ways. It, it also plays out as a systemic sort of way in our whole, you know, education and training system too, if you don't have people switched on to what employers and industry are looking for. So is, has there been a notable difference um, throughout your career in terms of, you know, that communication piece that you talk about and how, you know, vitally important that will be in future and, you know, the human elements of jobs being even more human. Um, with people growing up surrounded by technology, do you find that that's missing? I don't know if that's missing, but I think it's about where you place the emphasis or the importance. And definitely, you know, being across new discovery technologies is really important, but that's more to enhance your human skills, if you like, mm. rather than to make that the total focus of it. And you definitely need to have like an open mind to um, what's on offer. And in fact, you know, our aim is to be at the forefront of that because if you don't know what what's coming, um, what those technologies are, are potential, the potential that they can have in terms of the impact, um, you know, you are then likely to perhaps study something or go into an area where, you know, there's not the opportunity. So you've got to have a broader sort of perspective and more of a global perspective. So that's definitely something cultural and global was one of the other capabilities and that's one of the areas that uh, perhaps, you know, in Australia we don't have as much of a focus on as what we should. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you do a lot of work overseas. What, can you tell us a, yeah. a little bit about that? For sure. So it, it varies from doing a workforce plan for a country like Bhutan to hosting delegations from the Maldives on their apprenticeship system and education, as well as um, capability and capacity development. And that has different sorts of flavours. So we regularly host entrepreneurial startup scale up delegations from places like Indonesia. Uh, that includes ministries and, you know, unicorn type companies and people participating in their 1,000 startups program. So essentially you're bringing people out to Australia or to Adelaide particularly to have a look around and, and to learn from what they see and then they mm -hmm. go back with, you know, more information, more skills to, yeah. to push them forward? There's an in-country part as well and then uh, what we're aiming to do is line up those companies with Australian-based startups and companies where they could have potential partnership and explore different markets. Mm. Um, and other groups we host from places like the Philippines, you know, that might be industry-specific capability like food and wine and tourism or mm -hmm. that sort of example. So mm. you talked about the, work, the workforce plan for Bhutan. Uh-huh. How the heck do you yeah, start? Yeah, I know. <laughs> you know how, how, firstly, how did it come about? And yeah. secondly, yeah, how did you go about doing that. I know. I, this story is just, I love this story because um, we were, you know, doing a lot of work in Australia. We work in every state and territory, all these different regions, but really had a passion to have like a broader impact um, because we could sort of see, you know, how the work impacts on and changes people's lives and companies and so on. But then I'm like, well, how do we even do that? How do we even get an international context to our work or some sort of global opportunity? So I found that like when we put it into our actual strategic plan and we started communicating that with people, people were like, oh, okay, so we didn't know before that you wanted to do this. But I remember with Bhutan I got a phone call and it was Christmas Eve um, in 2012, I think it was, and I sort of looked at my phone and I saw this, this guy's number flash up and I sort of knew, oh, well, if he's ringing me, there's something kind of important perhaps happening and it's really weird to do this on a Christmas Eve you know, when I'm at home cooking with the girls and everything. And so I answered the phone call and he said, uh, Wendy, I've got this opportunity. I wondered if you were interested in doing some work in like late January, so pretty quick, in Bhutan and the Maldives. And there were two projects that were back to back. So that was more capability development to start off with, running, you know, workshops and working with the ministry, heads of industry, the universities, the TVET institutions. And over time with Bhutan in particular, that's built into a long-term relationship where we've had a number of delegations here, been to Bhutan, you know, on trips a number of times and they had this um, local group sort of have a go at doing their workforce plan and then when I was there, um, the head of the, the ministry asked me to have a look at it and it clearly needed a lot of work. So 
Uh, we took more of a coaching mentoring approach and worked with, with those guys from the ministry as well to really get it up to scratch so they, they would be proud of something for their whole country. Mm. So did they have set ideas about what they were trying to achieve or did you sort of come in with a bit of a blank canvas and go, okay, what can we create here? Well, Bhutan like, is an adorable country and they do get worried about things like unemployment, even though compared to Australia, the unemployment rate is really, really low. Mm-hmm. They also have the Gross National Happiness Institute because they're the wow. country that you know measures happiness. So there's, there's nine elements in that and, and part of that is about economic development, social workforce participation. and But it's also about how you spend your time and your health and your family. Mm-hmm. So there were bits of the puzzle. This is often what our work is like. So there's pieces of the puzzle there would be perhaps a, a broad strategy about where the um, country was going to go from an economic sort of point of view. And then obviously they want to figure out how, to, how do you match your workforce to it. Most people don't have a systematised approach to workforce planning and development. That's the key point of difference with the way that we work. And um, we also have an approach where we don't hold on to that IP tightly. It's something that everyone should be able to, to do. Mm-hmm. So what does a workforce plan actually look like? Like when you yeah. talk about it, it's, it mm-hmm. sounds like a, an amazing document, but but what does it actually tell people? It's probably not as complex. People make it more complex than what it needs to be. So the sort of uh, approach, if you were reading a document, it has a bit in there about the full picture. So what's going on in whatever the context is, what's the implication for your workforce? It has a, a, an analysis of the current workforce at this time. What does the workforce look like? What are some of the strengths and gaps and so on? The bit that's the hardest bit is then knowing what you want into the future. So you've got to be able to describe that and say what your critical job roles are and your critical capabilities and figure out how far out you're, you're looking. And then it's pretty much we've got this workforce now, we want this one into the future, what's the gap? And then there's an action plan that, that follows and... You can get a nice report, let's say, but the key thing is about the actual actions and knowing what you're going to do to address those gaps and the priorities and who's involved. So that is made much more of a focus in the work that we do rather than a nice pretty report. Mm. How often does something come out of that process which takes you by surprise and you know presents an opportunity that no one in the room saw? So sometimes uh, because we're pulling together the bits of the puzzle and people have done maybe some work before, we'll have an existing set of problems or issues or gaps. But I think what happens when we're looking at all of that evidence, the thing that surprises me the most is when there's not something there that we would expect to be there. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. But, um, you know, when you've looked at so many workforce plans over the years and you think, okay, well, they're not looking at new discovery technology or innovation or global expansion, if they're, if they're not focused on that and, and you know that really in that industry or in that region, that location, that country, they should be, then you sort of go, what's going on? What's going on with this? Mm. Yeah. I suppose it just shows that, you know, people are coming from their own context, aren't they? You know, having someone, you know, see it newly from outside, you know, probably opens up a, a world of possibilities. Yeah. And, you know, there is a lot of commonality as well. Mm. So, because you're talking about workforce jobs, skills, and often it doesn't matter what industry or what country or region, like I can, I, I had this conversation recently when I was um, in Bhutan and I was around the table in my traditional dress with these um, tourism operators, traditional dresses, like this really bright sort of jacket and this long skirt and, you know, with all of these um, employers. And you just sort of pinch yourself and go, I could literally be sitting around a table in New Zealand or, you know, somewhere in Europe with the same sort of group of employers and they all say the same thing about mm. what they're trying to do, what they're what they're looking for. Mm. Yeah. So, what's the most common thing that you you are finding? The most common thing is probably that digital capability area. Leadership is often something, mm. and every workforce plan says that communication could do better. Mm. The thing that changes is what the critical job roles are, and what the priority kind of capability areas areas might be. And part of that depends upon how much effort perhaps has been put into different things in the past or the point in time that you're doing the workforce plan, you know, for the organisation or the industry sector. Um, But what we're seeing increasingly, which is a bit of a shift even from a couple of years ago, is um, more and more acute skill and labour shortages. Uh, You know, we just did a workforce plan, for example, for Kangaroo Island and that example is is one of those where the population, you know, 4,850, you know, less than 100 unemployed people, there is over 40 critical job roles on the list. Now, Mm. they don't all need huge numbers in them, 
But, um, you know, particularly where the population is smaller or you're in a regional location, we just did one in Sunraysia as well. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a flip around that's happening, at least in the Australian economy anyway, back to massive skills and labour shortages. We're talking to Wendy Perry, Managing Director of Workforce Blueprint. Up next, we'll find out about the importance of communication when you've created a business with global impact. Download the Phoner app before you head to your next event. Find people easier, market yourself better and get connected using Phoner. That's spelled P-F-O-N-R. Phoner, available in the App Store now. Hi, I'm Ashley Manuel from Growing With Gratitude and you're listening to The In Show. The In Show. We're speaking with Managing Director of Workforce Blueprint, Wendy Perry. Wendy, when you're referring to communications, are you referring to the way that people talk to each other or is it a broader brush than that? And what do you do to help? So some of these things are pretty basic. Like it is about how you communicate day to day and how you encourage your team members and, you know, recognise what they do and just also pick up more from a um, behavioural perspective about what's going on. So I think um, for those people that might be supervisors or leaders or in management roles, they have to be much more connected to what else is going on with their, with their employees now. And the way that you can address that and, and some of the sessions and things that we run is more about um, coaching through conversation and, you know, some techniques about how to get agreement and how to um, some more behavioural-based competency style not tricks exactly, but techniques, let's say, to shift things, shift people mm. from where they might be into something more positive, particularly if it's around like motivation or in an industry area where the work is really challenging. Mm. Certainly a great difference, you know, when comparing communication and just talking. Yeah. I think I've sure. discovered working in radio for a long time, there's a lot of talk and, uh, you know, not a lot else happening uh, yeah. from time to time. <laughs> for sure. So tell me about, you know, um, with so much moving around us these days and, you know, uh, Things seem to be you know, evolving at a very rapid rate. When people are looking for jobs, mm-hmm. have you got any suggestions around how people should approach what training they do? I suppose I'm thinking of you know high school students then going into university, and, and with yep. what you said, you know the, the three to to five year plan. I mean, you know, you almost you step into your study at a point where the world is a certain way, and you step out with it being another way. Mm-hmm. Is there any research that people can do? And I suppose yeah. it's, it's, it's the difference between are people just following their passion mm-hmm. or are they looking to study to get a job? Yes, yeah. yeah. I mean, I always think it's important to balance your passion with actually where the job demand and growth is. And so if you did want to have clues or hints about that, you would be looking more at economic development type mm-hmm. policy. And, you know, it doesn't have to be really... Um, you know, in depth or you know, or challenging, you can look at more what are the economic priority type areas, you know, for your region, if you want to have more of a career locally or for your country or if you're looking at some sort of other global context. And that information is really easily available. So mm-hmm. you can find out, you know, for Indonesia or Philippines or whatever country, Germany, you know, what are those key areas? And you can do the same in Australia for every region, every city, state or whatever. So that gives you a clue because usually that research is done with that future view, at least, you know, the next five to ten years usually. Local government can be a great source of information too because they're usually doing, you know, significant forward forward planning. And the way to figure out, okay, what areas you might be passionate about, because a lot of people probably wouldn't even know, right, if they're young about mm. what the job roles might even be like. Yeah. So you've got to give people an experience of the future job role but in the here and now. Mm. Um, otherwise things wouldn't even be, you know, that wouldn't even cross their mind that they could do something like that. And a real case in point and something that um, we talk about if you want resilience with your career, number one job for resilience. I don't know if you guys would know. Do you want to have a guess what it might be? Ooh, one job for resilience. Mm, I don't know. So if you did this job, you'd be okay, you know, literally for your whole career, one job. Isn't it it's sort of a... Got us on the spot. Yeah. yeah. I, <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's unusual for us to get the questions coming back yeah. at us. Yeah. <laughs> My head it was sort of going towards like a more of a sort of traditional occupation or something that's always existed. I was going to say banking, but then with all the conversations we've had on this show about how that might look in the future, I, I can't even yeah. say that certainly. Well, but this it, this occupation has existed forever and it's to be an entrepreneur and that's whether or not you're pursuing your own business idea or you're being an entrepreneur, you know, which is an entrepreneur for your employer 
or you're pursuing social enterprise, social outcomes. So that's number one thing because mm. it's been around for forever. Um, and also if you've got that set of capabilities, you can pretty much, you should be anyway, able to sort of, you know, move with what's happening and get ahead and, you know, be more open to adopting new technologies and whatever's changing. Mm. And then you finding um, that that people when they're thinking about jobs of the future, are they are they actually thinking into the future or are they still just sitting in, okay, what's going to get me going for the next couple of years and then they'll pivot and change and and whatever? Or, or you know, is, is this becoming, um, you know, the people are looking at, at a more longer term? Because I notice as, um, you know, as I see the generation coming through at the moment, they're quite happy to shift and change often mm-hmm. and and more often than, than not. You know, the, the longest period of time when I was going through getting my first job where, you know, the employer would look at, at your resume and see how long you'd been in, employed in a particular place mm-hmm. uh, and then they'd, they'd look at you as a very loyal, very da-da-da-da. Um, but I'm not seeing that now in, in the young people because they just want to shift and change all the time. How do you mm-hmm. sort of bring all that together and, and help employers manage themselves through that? This is a couple of things. Like I think what's shifting at the moment is the chat or the conversation about it. And there's definitely a lot of attention in the media now about future jobs and there's headlines that are not helpful. There's, there's literally no way that somebody can know how many jobs they're going to be versus what we've got now into the future. Like it's a total guesstimate. And some of those headlines are just unhelpful because they... They freak people out. And when you're dealing with young people too, the question of what do you want to be when you grow up should just be deleted from our conversation because it's it's not a destination one answer. It's much more broader as you're sort of describing, David. And for employers that means that the way that they structure their job roles, and it is changing too, their job roles are much more multi-skilled and it's kind of like... Um, two areas that wouldn't necessarily go together are being put together now. So um, so I think... What's an example of that? Well, you know, artificial intelligence trainer, you know, or smart city designer or, you know, there's there's things that are sort of like something that's a bit more older school together with something that's sort of, you know, Mm. fresher or or newer is sort of coming on board. So there is, you know, a developing sort of list of, of future job roles, but... And, you know, it's things like science together with arts. You know, it's not like one or the other. Yep. So you've got to be more open-minded about what, what the job roles might be. And employers, you know, from their perspective too, particularly engaging with young people, work-life balance, you know, flexibility, um, having, you know, a really cool sort of environment to sort of work in, being able to work from home, you know, pursue these sort of opportunities. It's taking a lot of energy too for them to rethink like how do we how do we structure this to make these roles attractive absolutely i've got a question i mean the, the answer that i had when somebody asked me what i was going to do when i grew up i said i'm not going to grow up yeah <laughs> and i've lived by that ever since you are a bit of a peter pan aren't you? <laughs> i just can't fly <laughs> although we we saw a suit the other week that could i could put on and could fly absolutely you know, yeah. that might be far away yes well wendy it's extraordinary the work that uh, you're doing thanks so much for joining us today on the in show no worries. thanks for having me guys appreciate it it's all about innovation on the In Show. If you know an innovator that we should have on the show, well, drop us a line at theinshow.online and you can check us out on Facebook and Twitter. Next week on The In Show. We chat to the RAA, the Royal Automobile Association, that started as a sporting car club 114 years ago about how they're reinventing their business to take on the mobility of the future. They've got a lot to contend with, haven't they? And it's not too far away. Yeah, and autonomous cars, electric cars, it's going to completely change the way they they do their business. Yeah, exactly. Claire's going to come by with more stories from all around the world and you can subscribe to iTunes. Make sure you listen to the podcast there and rate us five stars if you like. Now, Troy, I always love how we end the show on a high note. And today we've got Sam Davies from Digital Noir talking about the greater integration of the internet in our lives. Catch you next week. One thing I've been thinking about a lot is sort of the internet of things and moving forward how we've got this sort of integration of the internet into everything in our lives. One thing we've talked about a lot in the studio is is voice. Um, It's interesting being on the radio talking about this but how voice control and, and even just things like podcasts and the radio is becoming sort of a much bigger part of our lives. We started thinking about how, so if you, um, I don't know if you've seen the movie Her with uh, Joaquin Phoenix, mm-hmm. who you know, falls in love with, it, with an operating system essentially, but have that idea of having you know, something in your ear which we can talk to. And even now I wake up in the morning and, and talk to a robot next to my bed to ask what's you know, on my calendar for the day. 
by Alexa what's on the calendar. But thinking forward, if we're controlling lots of things in our lives, you know, just with our voice, how does that change the shape of things like websites and apps? Because they're so visual at the moment, everything's controlled visually. I think if you said, oh, I need to find a, a web designer in Adelaide audibly now, most websites aren't going to be able to return that. So thinking about how mm. you know, voice is going to control our lives in the next sort of five, 10 years is pretty interesting. Obviously, there's sort of an, an AI ver- uh, part of it where how clever the voice is in sort of gauging what you're saying and, and what your your next sort of uh, step's going to be in the process. But I think websites are soon going to need to have a very clear pathway for someone that is browsing verbally. The In Show, presented by David Grice and Troy Sincock. News by Shannon Corvo and Claire Murphy. Music by Zach Grice. Produced by Jason Walker. Subscribe to the In Show podcast on iTunes. A Dave and the Beanstalk production. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.